I'm not going to talk about Africa at all or, or about technology. Um, I just want to uh, chat with you today a little bit about the ocean. And when I talk about the ocean, I'm thinking about the deep ocean. Um, I just had a look in, in the show here, and obviously it's called Tidal, Tidaletics. And I couldn't help thinking that if it was a... Now, I don't want to be rude now, but I couldn't help thinking that if it was a human body, it would probably be about the lips. It's kind of intimate, something you touch, but, but not, you know, it's somehow um, on the surface, you know. And, and what I'm interested in is the deep ocean. So I think that all the organs, the viscera, as we say in English, of the ocean is in the deep part of the ocean. Um, so I'm going to just chat a little bit about that. Um, I, I think it's always good to know where someone is from and why they're talking about what they're talking about. So uh, I'm the lucky guy because this is where I'm from. This is the Shetland Islands uh, in the, the north of Scotland. Um, the, the Shetland Islands are, are kind of halfway between the mainland of Scotland and uh, Iceland. So that's where I was born. And you can see that my relationship with the ocean started really when I was very, very small. Uh, in, in the Shetland Islands, they always say that they are uh, fishermen who have a little piece of land. And then there's the neighboring islands, the Orkney Islands, who they say that they're farmers who have a little boat. So uh, the Shetland people have always, um, throughout their history, been on the ocean. And um, you know, they, they traveled all over the world. They were big sailors. And unfortunately, they were whalers as well. They killed a lot of whales. Um, so that's where I began. But uh, uh, my whole career was uh, as, a, as a war correspondent and a foreign correspondent for uh, The Economist magazine, which is how I know Vienna a little bit. Uh, at one point in my career, I was the Central Europe correspondent uh, based out of Prague. So I used to come to Vienna in those days. This is... Um, uh, uh, the very first story I wrote uh, was just the Romanian Revolution. So I was about 21 years old when that happened. And it seems a really long, long, long time ago. But uh, I remember that very well. That was Christmas time, 1989. Um, so I've spent the, uh, the last 10 years uh, living in Africa. And I love this slide. I said I wasn't going to talk about Africa, but I just have to mention this slightly. Uh, tangentially, before we get onto the ocean. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of all time, I think. This is a picture of uh, Nairobi in the year 1904. Uh, the, these little dots that you can see are little tents of British, British railway engineers who uh, have built Nairobi as a city. And now Nairobi has five million people now today. And before uh, many of you retire, we'll have probably 11 or 12 million people. And you can see this is not that long ago, there was nothing there. So when we talk about the ocean, we have to always bear in mind what is happening on the, the land and how fast that is happening. And um, what will happen to our planet, and particularly in the ocean, which is out of sight and out of mind. Uh, it's all going very fast, and I think that's why it makes it a tremendously important subject to think about and really grapple with as a human being. Uh, what is this other ecosystem which you know coexists on our planet? Uh, this is not just another picture, I'm just showing you how fast things are going. All these, all these kids. Um, so uh, as Boris very kindly mentioned, uh, you know, I'm a novelist. And this is my uh, first novel, uh, which uh, was kind of weird. It was um, based on a true story about the largest herd of giraffes ever assembled, which was assembled in the Czechoslovakian zoo uh, in the northern part of what is now the Czech Republic, who were shot dead by the secret police in 1975. So it's a kind of meditation on 
wild animals or nature, a little bit about communism and captivity. Um, and this is what I'm really here to talk about today. This is my second novel, it was, uh, called Submergence. And the novel is uh, really about perspective on, on who we are and where we are on the planet. So half of the novel is about the deep ocean. Um, the, the main character is a, is a mathematician. She is a professor and she studies microbial life on the bottom of the sea floor of the ocean. And the other character is uh, is a British spy uh, who uh, it sounds a bit corny, but I hope it's not. Uh, and anyway, they have a love affair. And uh, now in this film, uh, you can judge for yourselves because um, it's just been made into a Hollywood movie by the German director Wim Wenders. So Wim finished uh, shooting the film uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, the film will uh, will be here in Vienna in in December in, in the cinemas. Uh, it'll premiere at the uh, Venice uh, Film Festival. And um, there's Vim on the set. And uh, these are the two main uh, actors. Uh, there's Alicia Vikander. She's the one who plays the uh, ocean ocean scientist. And James McAvoy uh, is a fellow Scotsman. Um, who plays the main character. So um, we were really lucky in, in the film that in my novel, uh, a lot of the work on the ocean uh, happens around the French uh, oceanographic research vessel. And uh, you can see it there, that, that's the Nautil. So I say I'm really interested in the deep ocean. There's only six craft on the whole planet that can go down to a depth uh, to explore what is 90% of the living space on our planet. Just think about that. Six of those on the whole planet to explore 90% of the living space in our world and the largest living space in our solar system. We have not even begun to think about this this space, and the space is dark, uh, it's of a crushing pressure, uh, the life there is very difficult for us to relate to, a lot of it's uh, small, microbial life, uh, you have these vertical migrations every day, so the creatures there are moving from four or five kilometers, sometimes six or seven kilometers down and they move up towards the daylight every day. And then as the sun goes down, then they descend again. Um, we were very lucky when we were shooting the film that we managed to persuade this French uh, oceanographic research agency, Ifremer. They actually lent us the real submersible. So we got to go down and experience it for real. Um, that was really extraordinary. Uh, gets down to 7,500 meters. So about, you know, almost as, um, I think the deepest it, it, uh, uh, you can go is, uh, well, James Cameron, the filmmaker, he actually went down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the Challenger Deep with his own, uh, his own designed vessel, but of the proper research vessels which can actually look out and explore. I think the Japanese one, Shinkai, goes to, I think, uh, 7,800 meters. It's pretty hard. I mean, James Cameron was kind of amazing because he went to the bottom of uh, the Challenger Deep, but that was the first time since 1960. So we we have many more human beings on the moon than on the bottom of the ocean. And one of the things which drove me a lot in, uh, in writing this novel was this very weird human need. It might be kind of biologically built into us that we look outwards. We have Star Trek and all of these 
need, Elon Musk is going to Mars in our lifetime. But the, the other world that we have in our world is completely unexplored, unthought about. And um, in terms of art, uh, one of my good friends is uh, the Icelandic Danish artist uh, Olafur Eliasson. So Olafur and I, we just started out to, to think through an art piece that we want to put together in 2019. And maybe, maybe we'll put it in the Tate Modern in the Turbine Hall, if you know that very large hall there. And, and it's really about the deep ocean. And uh, Olafur says it's probably the most frightening thing it's done because it's really hard to get the human mind into that space. There's no light, there's no air. Uh, as they say, the pressure is enormous. It's really difficult, and the volume, and all, also humans, we're always looking at the surface of things. We always gravitate towards the margins. So if I was to ask any of you, you'd probably want to know what was on the sea floor. But actually, what's really amazing about the ocean is the volumetric space. It's, it's so colossal. Uh, it's 98% of... Uh, of all the living biomass on the planet is is down there, and it's just it's an extraordinary place. Uh, oh, why do they have this? Oh, yes, this is. Um, so I said that half of the novel uh, is about. It, it's an attempt to meditate on our planets, so the surface of our planet, and and then the ocean, and so the character who's played by James McAvoy. Uh, he gets kidnapped in Somalia, which is a country I know quite well, by jihadists. So, to cut a long story short, I handed the novel in to my publisher in New York, and they said, uh, this is great, but how are we going to sell a novel which has the deep ocean and jihad in it at the same time? And then a really weird thing happened. The same week that I handed in the novel, uh, Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistan, and he was buried at sea in the North uh, Indian Ocean. So exactly the area in the novel that my scientist uh, is exploring, uh, Osama bin Laden was, was dropped in there. And a lot of my novel is a, a meditation on these microbial forms of life. So this idea that there's there's more life in the bottom of the ocean than, than on the surface of the world. And it, I find it really fascinating that, that, that Osama's body is being done through uh, by the, exactly the kind of microbes that we're uh, talking about in, in, in the novel. Um, that's the Nortiel again. I thought I would just uh, read you, just to give you... Uh, a flavor of my novel. I'm just going to read you uh, a, a page from it. Which I will find them. Um, it's towards the end of the book, and and it's really so. Uh, scientists divide the deep ocean into different layers. There's the epipelagic, which is what we have in here. This is the surface. I'm not very interested in that. And then the mesopelagic, and then you go down, and then the really weird place is called the halopelagic, which is named obviously after hell, Hades. And so, uh, I'm, and that's where most of this microbial life is. And I'm just uh, meditating on this uh, in 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 this section of the novel. And 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 uh, it it it's just a a meditation on who we are as humans and where we're going in our in our bodily form. Um, it is understandable you would want to come back as yourself into a wonderland with the sharpness and color of the Queen of Hearts in a newly opened pack of playing cards. But coming back as yourself, 
is resurrection. It is uncommon. It may even be greater than the scope of mathematics. We cannot talk about the definition of our souls, but it is certain that we will decompose in our bodies. Some dust of ourselves may end up in a horse, in a wasp, in a cockerel, frog, flower, or leaf. But for every one of these sensational assemblies, there are a quintillion microorganisms. It is far likelier that the greater part of us will become protoists than a skyscraping mouse. What is likely is that sooner or later, carried in the wind and in rivers or your graveyard engulfed in the sea, a portion of each of us will be given new life in the cracks, vents, or pools of molten sulfur on which the tongue fish skate at the bottom of the ocean. You will be in Hades, the staying place of the spirits of the dead. You will be drowned in oblivion, the river Lethe, swallowing water to erase all memory. It will not be the nourishing womb you began your life in. It will be a submergence. You will take your place in the boiling hot fissures among the teeming hordes of nameless microorganisms that mimic no forms because they are the foundation of all forms. In your reanimation, you will not be aware. You will be aware only that you are a fragment of what once was and are no longer dead. Sometimes this will be an electric feeling, sometimes the sensation of the acid you eat or the furnace under you. You will burgle and rape other cells in the dark for a seeming eternity but nothing will come of it. Hades, the bottom of the ocean, is evolved to the highest state of simplicity. It is stable, whereas you are a tottering tower, so young in evolutionary terms and so addicted to consciousness. So I think I'm trying to explore there this idea that that our species is only 90,000 years old. And at the bottom of the ocean, we have species which are three and a half billion years old. And that the diversity of species there is about 80% of all known species of the planet. But as they say, we only have those six vehicles to explore it. So it, we're really at the beginning of an extraordinary uh, moment. And uh, obviously, uh, there's one piece there which I feel a little bit sad for those jellyfish. But th these are some of these bioluminescent life forms that you find in, in the deep ocean. And of course, I spent a lot of time exploring with scientists uh, this other colossal point, uh, which is maybe the point to finish on. Um, which is that until 1977, every scientist in the world believed that all life on the planet, trees, grass, a dog, was photosynthetic, that everything came from the sun. In 1977, one of these craft, the American craft, the Alvin, uh, in the Caribbean Sea, uh, discovered the first hydrothermal vents. And from that point on, we realized that life could exist in two ways in our world, both photosynthetic and chemosynthetic. So we have this extraordinary uh, discovery that uh, life at the bottom of the ocean is developed purely through chemicals and heat. 
And from that, we get to an even more extraordinary idea, which is that we ourselves were from the deep. This is where we began in our primal, primal form, in our base form. So the very first cellular life was coming up through vents like this. So in, in the history of evolutionary life, maybe 80, 85% of our evolutionary history is in the darkness, is in the heat, is in the bottom of the ocean. And I find that a very, very powerful thought. Um, I think I'll just leave it there for now. Uh, I'm not sure, how am I doing for time there, boys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy to chat afterwards or I'll, I'll get questions now. You might say thin. <laughs> Contributor, uh, journalist, novelist to working with scientists and etc. etc. I think this is this is to to hear a bit more about your, your CVs is quite interesting. Um thank you. Uh the um uh, I think it's all about curiosity really. I mean uh, uh the the I was very lucky to work for the economist uh because it's really intellectually hard work. You 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 have to do a lot of work for every story. And um, well, actually, it, st it started that this whole thing started in Central Europe because uh, you know you have these terrible winters in Central Europe, and uh, one year probably it was like nineteen ninety nine. Um, uh, I, I was already very fascinated in the ocean. The only job I ever had, the only sort of real job uh, I ever had, was to work one year as a fisherman. Um, and I was really bad uh, at that. Um, so I always had this passion for the ocean. But I, I discovered there was a fellowship at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. Uh, and Woods Hole is one of the top places in the world for ocean research. And uh, I don't think they had any other applicants because uh, they accepted me and I had no qualifications to go. And when I was there, my mind was truly, as the Americans would say, my mind was truly blown. It was really extraordinary. I mean, I, I met a professor who had personally discovered over 500 species of jellyfish, personally. And he was only in his 50s. And, and it was suddenly, once I started getting my head, not around the sea. See, I grew up around the sea, which is the surface of things. And the sea is great, it's cool, it's Pirates of the Caribbean and uh, fishing and uh, surfing and all of this stuff. But that's not the ocean, you know? So once you start understanding about the ocean, then, it, then that was really kind of extraordinary. Um, but uh, yeah, about the other stuff, I, you know, I just, I just kind of follow my nose, really. Uh, I think that's, that's just... Uh, work hard and uh, explore. Does this work? Sort of. Works for you. Um, for me, it is unclear whether your interest in the oceans and in the deep is one that comes from art and literature or from science and exploration or um, any other sort of field, politics possibly. Um, because I guess every field has its own apparatus and its own sort of body of knowledge. And I guess um, it also leads me to this question. Um, or, you know, advocacy obviously could also be one of those fields of interest. 
because it also leads me to this question uh, that you know understanding that the, the 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 void of the ocean right or this representation of void that we have in our histories and so on is is something that has led to a lot of I would say neglect and uh, probably the condition in which the oceans are suffering today. Um, but how then, you know, from your perspective and from your engagement in the ocean, how then is um, is there a possibility to sort of change that perception? Is that mm. through knowledge? Is that through sort of visual material? You know, what where where do you come from? Where you know, where, where do I play to? That's a great question. I, I think the. Um for me, uh, everything I write is about perspective. So if I have one goal with this novel, it would be just slightly to alter the pers your perspective of the planet that you're living on. Who are you? How old are you? How long will you be around? What is the world? We know that these life forms that we're talking about from the bottom of the ocean will outlast all of our civilization and will forget that we were ever here. Um, and I think when I mentioned very briefly my first novel, Giraffe, I, I was very interested in that novel, looking at these wild animals, and actually just looking at animal closely, and thinking, I, I, you know, th this otherness is really important to me, I think, as a writer, as a thinker. You know, uh, I'm very opposed to anthropocentric thinking and obviously our animals yeah <laughs> other, and, other than you <laughs> yeah exactly and i and i think the, the 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 ocean just takes it to a whole other level because most people can relate to a giraffe in a certain way uh it's you know a vertical creature it's very beautiful and it's a mammal uh but i think that was I, I tend to think, uh, this sounds a bit pretentious, but I really think a lot in planetary terms. So I think even when I'm showing you those pictures of Africa, I'm thinking, uh, you know, the population of Africa is going to double in our lifetime. Yeah, and, and, and we've lost, in the last 15 years, over 50% of the biodiversity in Africa. It's just gone. And in fact, we lost 90% of the giraffes in the last 15 years. 90% of the wild giraffes on the planet. So what goes for the land is also going for the ocean. But of course, the ocean is what drives our climate. It's what keeps our air clean. Um, it's what's going to feed us over long periods of time. Uh, and obviously, there's another weird um, aspect, which is that we haven't really found life anywhere else yet. You know, there, m there might be some chemosynthetic life of a tiny kind somewhere in our solar system, but it's not much. <laughs> so we do have an enormous ethical uh, weight on us to first preserve and then understand and then cohabit with, uh, with this other space. So. But I, I, for me, you said at the beginning, for me, the science is very important. The literature is even more important, obviously. But uh, you have to understand the science in as much as we have the science. So I really spent a lot of time with mathematicians, really at a very high level at MIT and, uh, and Imperial College in London and uh, at Cole Polytechnic in Paris, really try and understand uh, what is the volume of life down there? Why do we think there's so much life? What is it? How does it live? What does it eat? You know, um, I find that very, very important. You start with the science. On the literature side, you know, I find it extraordinary that we're, we're, what, we're in 2017. We're way into the 21st century. And still, the main reference point on the ocean is Jules Verne. And, and, Jovan doesn't talk about darkness, he doesn't talk about pressure, he doesn't talk about any other living creature except a bloody squid. Um, and, and that's our reference point as a species. So and the treasure. Yeah, so it's the treasure. And the, I mean, this is an extraordinary episode where he goes down, I think, off Cuba, I think, and they're all walking on the bottom of the sea. I mean, and 
nothing against Jules Verne, though he was a terrible racist, so maybe something against him. Um, but it, it just says something about our, our lack of curiosity. You know? and, uh, so together with Jacques Cousteau, the French have dominated the deep sea, no? <laughs> yeah. But, but Cousteau is an amazing guy, but obviously, again, he was epi epipelagic guy. He was Mr. Scuba, right? Um, so if you couldn't film with a camera, he wasn't, he wasn't interested. And this piece that we're working on with Olafur, you know, immediately you're confronted with enormous philosophical and practical questions. So if you want to see the deep ocean, okay, you can go down with a robot or a submersible, ball, but do you turn the lights on? Okay, if you turn the lights on, everything sees you for 12 kilometers around you, and you've completely changed that ecosystem utterly. Uh, so whatever you're seeing is only the interaction between you, this alien, and, and that li uh, life there. And then if you don't have the lights on, you can't see anything. So it's, it's so, so sight is out. The touch. But they already had your acoustic signals, you know, the moment you emerged. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I see this almost um, very visually because half the novel is set in this really burning desert in Somalia, and then half the novel is set in the blackness of the ocean. So, really, I mean, uh, it is a kind of planetary novel in that sense where you're just trying to say, and I think one of the one of the weird things and the most beautiful things about us as species is we are a, we're, we're a complete contradiction because on the one hand I'm saying in a very Malthusian almost fascistic way we're nothing we don't matter these microbes matter you know the IKEA and the bacteria they matter because they're going to be here for you know uh, several more billion years, and we won't. But on the other hand, uh, the, the, we love, we, we, we fall in love, and we, we, we exist, and we, we have our moments, which is, which is incredible and intense. So it's this weird, so the film, is, I mean, the film and the novel, the film is much more a love story, and the novel is a love story, but it's got this more meditative side. Um, well, you should just read it and see. <laughs> yeah, I feel it. Uh, it's not relevant to this discussion, but it's relevant to us as citizens uh, of Europe uh, right now. Um, you know, I, with The Economist, one of my jobs was to be the terrorism correspondent. So I spent a lot of time with uh, jihadists, really meeting with jihadist commanders. And so a lot of the novel is about belief. Uh, it's about uh, the idiocy of jihad. Um, and why people fall into it. I think the thing which is really sad, uh, but predictable, but still sad, is, you know, uh, um, where we are right now is a much more violent place than when I was writing the book. I was able to sit down and actually talk with Al-Qaeda commanders, you know, face to face. Uh, when I was researching the novel, and now, of course, uh, you wouldn't get anywhere close to these guys. Uh, and there was one moment, uh, it's maybe too, oh, it's such an awful thing, but the, uh, just as I was finishing the book, the, uh, uh, the ISIS in Libya captures about 50, 50 uh, 
uh, Ethiopian uh, workers, and they beheaded all of them on on the beach in the Mediterranean. And, and then then my friends sent me the pictures of of the ocean, which was red. It was red like in the Faroe Islands when they're killing the whales, and it was just a uh, so that's probably that's the one thing which has changed the most is that yeah we we're, we're really in a sticky spot in that sense. I have a, uh, another question. Uh, uh, your novel is being filmed by Wim Bendes, and uh, you are speaking about uh, the limits of of. Senses and, and sensual experience in the in the deep. Uh, so, uh, if you can tell us how Bim Vendas is dealing with this aspect of of like you know, like beyond senses, because I mean we know that visuality is is in huge percent about depiction, not about seeing, but about depiction. But but can you tell us a bit more about that, like the transfer of the the non visual to text and from text to back to visual? Well, I mean, I, I, I remember the producer, when the producer got the money together for the film, he said it had to be Vim who was directing it. Um, because, you know, Vim, uh, I mean, he has a very good eye for the planets, you know. He, he, some of his films are really very naturalistic. Um, so I think right from the beginning, Vim was really obsessed with this idea of how you film blackness. So he reached out to James Cameron, uh, who obviously is is an extraordinary film director when he's talking about the ocean. Um, and uh, uh, Benoit, the cinematographer, they spent a lot of time thinking about that, how, how you're going to film underwater. It's really hard, actually. And I think... Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this art project with Olafur is that I realized that science um, has done a great job on the on the mathematics, the chemistry of the ocean. It's done a very, very poor job of uh, of getting ordinary people like us to really understand this other space. Uh, they failed in that. And Jacques Cousteau has said, was you know what he was, but he was really about the surface of things. So, for me, conceptual art. If there is any group of people who's actually going to crack that problem, it's probably going to be the art world. There's so much about orientation in space. You know, light, maybe, maybe sound. I mean, you might end up with a sound installation, possibly. Uh, but but Vim, you know, he spent a lot of time, and he was in in the Atlantic and uh, the Mediterranean, and then uh, in Somalia they went to Djibouti, and then they went to uh, the Faroe Islands. So they shot on water and below water in all of those places. So I haven't seen the final cut yet. So We'll, we'll we'll see, but I know that he tried really hard, and I, he told me the other week it was the best film he's ever made. So, so no pressure.